I can't be the only one that didn't realize that there are still five teams in the NFL that don't have a mascot, and some of those are for obvious reasons, and some are because I don't even think we know what their mascot would even be. But one of these teams has the weirdest mascot history in a drama that has played out now over decades for one of the wildest storylines in all of sports history. So I'm talking about my Green Bay Packers and in order to understand where this drama started, we have to go all the way back to 1919 when the team was founded and Earl Curly Lambeau gets a donation of $500, which is $8,400 in today's money from his employer for uniforms and equipment. And he's given this donation on one condition that the team be named after its sponsor, which was the Indian Packing Company, a meat packing company in Green Bay. So naturally they take the location of the team, Green Bay, merge it together with the now new nickname of the team, the Packers to get the Green Bay Packers. If we understand mascots at the time, they weren't super prominent in early American sports, but when they were, they were utilized as a good luck charm. And two of the things that represented good luck at the time were animals, which makes sense, and children. So you have mascots that are the live animal representations of their teams, oftentimes just random animals like dogs that are meant to sit on the sidelines to bring the team good luck, or you have a child that is dressing up to bring the team good luck. And the Packers who really didn't have an animal to represent their team and didn't want to utilize as a child just went throughout their early years without any sort of a mascot. And as I mentioned earlier, they're actually still one of just five teams in the NFL without a mascot. Although the commanders now have one, it might be going away soon, but it's the Packers, the Chargers, the Giants, and the Jets, all teams without official mascots. And in the early 70s of the NFL as the league was finally solidifying itself as a really popular league in America, the NFL wanted to change that, but not before the Green Bay Packer fan said, I would like something to say about that. That brings us to 1978. And there's a guy by the name of Robert Wagner, a Packer super fan by the name of Robert Wagner, who lives about 30 minutes south of Green Bay in a city called Oshkosh. And he starts popping up at games in Lambeau Field. He calls himself gangrene, he wore a green wig, face paint, tights, a t-shirt, and a cape, and he would run up and down the aisles of the stadium to get the crowd hyped up. And the team was perfectly happy to allow this since they didn't have an official mascot. The idea of the mascot at the time would be a guy that would be running around anyway. And so they were happy for Robert to take up that task. But fans started complaining about the fact that he was getting really annoying running up and down. And there's even an article that I unearthed here uh, that mentioned he <laughs> changed his name, uh, his first name legally to green to honor the Packers. And then he also had a, it says here, a green and gold Chevy pickup truck. He even had tattoos and baked G's on his teeth to show his devotion to the team. And the devotion got so intense that fans started complaining about the fact that he was here. So the plan that the team devised wasn't to kick gangrene out of the stadium. Instead, it was to let him down on the field so he could continue his charade. And he actually struck a deal, according to an article at the time in 1983, to show up still as gangrene to Packer games and run around on the field at Lambeau Field. And at the time, the Packers were still playing in Milwaukee County Stadium. And he was dubbed the unofficial official mascot of the Green Bay Packers. But then there was a game in 1983 where Robert Wagner found his way back up into the stands where he was expressly told he wasn't allowed and sheriffs came down and threatened to arrest him for running up and down the aisles in a section that he didn't have tickets for. Now, Robert Green put his conspiratorial hat on here and thought that the team was pressuring the cops to come down and threaten to arrest him because they didn't like the fact that he was running around and showing up the team on the field. At the time, the Packers were not a very good team, and he claimed that the fans loved him doing that. But if you remember, it was the fans who complained to put him down on the field in the first place. But regardless, he says that when it came down to it, he considered himself to be the number one Packer fan in the world. But if you believe Robert Green, there might've been a conspiracy baking because the very next year, everything changed for the team when it came to the mascot. So it's 1984 and the NFL has become really obsessed with branding its league to all segments of people and making sure there's some unified look in terms of mascots and merchandising. And so they devise a plan to create a program that they call the NFL Huddles Program. Now, the idea here was to give each team a cute, cuddly little character that they could sell via little plush toys or merchandise and even have live real figure mascot stand on the sideline. They understood that many of their teams like the Green Bay Packers didn't actually have a real mascot to represent the team. So they thought we're just going to make one for you. 
and we get the NFL huddles program. So you could order them in a catalog again, seeing these plush toys, but there were also things like trading cards that you could buy t-shirts, a whole slew of merchandise. And you can see all the teams here, actually some really cute ones. My favorite being the horse, the dolphin, all really cute players with helmets on, of course. And then you have the Green Bay Packers guy here. So this was the first time an official Green Bay Packers mascot had been announced to the public. And keep in mind, this was coming from the NFL. This was not coming from the Green Bay Packers. But regardless, it's how we got the mascot known as Packy the Packer. So in 1984, the Packers were in this transitory stage. As I mentioned, they weren't very good. They'd actually just fired their previous head coach, Bart Starr, who was a Super Bowl winning QB for them in the Vince Lombardi days. He came back to coach the team wasn't doing so well. And so they replaced him with his former teammate, a guy by the name of Forrest Gregg. And as you see here, that year, the Packers were getting new cheerleaders. They were getting more concession stands, bigger and better bathrooms, but most notably, they were getting Packy the Packer, which was a sausage carrying, Bigfoot flannel wearing type butcher with a Green Bay Packers helmet on. And he was meant to make his appearance in the exhibition or the preseason for the Green Bay Packers as a real life mascot. The first time the team had ever had an official mascot. Now, the man responsible for being inside of this monstrosity was the guy by the name of Bruce Mandershed, a real Wisconsin Green Bay sounding name. Packy made his appearance at a preseason game, but in the second quarter, the costume was so heavy and so big that Mandershed fainted from heat exhaustion, which was just the beginning of the bad start and the bad omen for this mascot. Because later on in October, Mandershed, the guy in the mascot costume, went on Forrest Gregg's local TV show and talked about why he thought Packy the Packer was such a good fit for the team. He went on and said, quote, most of the people who are Packers fans are short, fat butchers with big feet and Newsflash, that did not play well for Packers fans. And just two short years later in 1986, the team discontinued the mascot and they threw the baby out with the bathwater too because they got rid of these cheerleaders that were also on the side of the field. And an interesting note about the Packers, still to this day, they don't have official team cheerleaders. Instead, they just rent out cheerleaders from a local university. Now, Packy the Packer might have been a bad omen for the team because they ended up going four and 12 in the final season with the mascot, missing the playoffs every single year the mascot was around. And it wasn't until the very next year that we started to get the inkling that maybe some sort of mascot or team representation shouldn't come from the league and it should maybe come from the team, maybe even the fans. That brings us to 1897. And we're actually not in Green Bay. We're down in Milwaukee where the Milwaukee Brewers are playing. And there's a fan in the stands who's wearing a cardboard cheese head to the game to represent his state pride and his love for cheese, I suppose. But the important part of the story is that there's a man in the stands by the name of Ralph Bruno, and he sees this man's cheese head and he gets an idea. So he goes home, he cuts up his mom's couch, takes the foam out, cuts it into the shape of a triangle and burns holes in it, making what is now the original cheese head. An interesting fact about Ralph Bruno is that he's been running this business now for decades and he's actually turned it into a multi-million dollar business selling other sorts of cheese head paraphernalia. And just this year in 2023, he actually sold his cheese head business to the Green Bay Packers for what I can only assume to be millions of dollars. However, my favorite story of the cheese heads isn't how it was made, although I feel bad for Ralph Bruno's mom's couch. It's the fact of how it got popularized. So let's fast forward now to 1995. There's a bit of momentum behind the cheese head, although the team hasn't fully embraced it yet. That is until the cheese head makes the news. So here's the story. There's this guy by the name of Frank Emmerich Jr. And he's flying back in his own plane from a Green Bay Packer game that was happening in Cleveland. On the way back, his plane accumulates ice and it starts to go down. What does Frank do as his plane is literally falling out of the sky and crashing? He grabs the cheese head he had brought with him to use it to cover his face. The plane crashes, he survives, only shatters his ankle, and later on doctors say that the fact that he used the foam cheese head to cover his face, it probably saved his life. And this exploded the popularity of the cheese head in the state of Wisconsin and solidified it as an official representation of Packer fans everywhere. However, the NFL wasn't done trying to make its mark for NFL teams and trying to force mascots down the throat of teams who at this point, frankly, didn't seem to want one. The Green Bay Packers had their beloved cheese head. They had finally got rid of the stink of Packy Packer, but the NFL wasn't done trying. We're still in 1995 and it's the Pro Bowl. We have these horrendous Pro Bowl jerseys. You see Deion Sanders and John Elway here with some triangle pattern that, I mean, it's straight out of 1995. But the most notable part for me are the mascots that debut at the Pro Bowl. Now, there isn't a lot of information about this program and why it happened. It was called the NFL Heroes Program, and there are NFL spokespeople that talk about it today. And 
Even these people, when they are honest about it, don't know why it existed or what even happened to the program because it was literally a one and done program. These mascots, not all of them for all 32 teams, but some of them showed up to the Pro Bowl and they were never seen again. So they literally made all of these costumes for all of these mascots and they were never used again. The one that was actually used and is still used to this day is the Cowboys mascot, Rowdy something that's still used today, but you see some maybe a little offensive to weird and stupid mascots at play here. One for the Pittsburgh Steelers. Again, not every team was represented. The Green Bay Packers were one of these teams that wasn't represented, but they still had an NFL hero mascot. It just wasn't a live action mascot. And maybe they learned their lesson with Packy Packer. Now I did some scraping of the internet and I was not able to find what I read about, which was the Green Bay Packers mascot was a polar bear named Bear. I'm gonna let that sink in for a second. Now, the idea by the NFL was that Bayer, B-A-Y-E-R, was going to be a representation of people from Green Bay. You are a Green Bayer, although I've never heard that said before. But what most people heard when they heard Bear the Polar Bear was Bear, B-E-A-R, AKA one of the biggest in-division rivals for the Green Bay Packers. So the NFL was trying to force the Packers to have a mascot that was a literal bear named Bear because they had no idea what they're talking about. So I scoured the internet to try to find this bear. And it seems like the NFL was more than happy to let this bear mascot die with all of these other really crappy mascots that made an appearance at the 1995 Pro Bowl. But the one trading card I was able to find to show us what this bear looked like was in this YouTube video by Crazy Loco. I'll give him a shout out here. He walked through all of the ugly mascots that were a part of this 1995 program. And here we have it. We have the bear team, NFL team hero, Green Bay Packer bear, kind of a sad looking polar bear. And frankly, why wouldn't you be? You're a polar bear in Green Bay, Wisconsin, when your biggest rival is, of course, the Chicago Bears. Now, the NFL clearly noticed their error, and maybe they noticed their error with all these mascots, and it's the reason we never saw them again. But in 1997, they released another edition of the NFL heroes for the Green Bay Packers. And this time, it's an angry looking man with, of course, a cheese head on that seems to be closer to Packy the Packer than it was to Bear the Polar Bear. But regardless, this was the NFL's final attempt to try to force a square peg into a round hole when it came to assigning mascots to teams who really didn't need or want them. Now, if I've learned anything from this rabbit hole is that I'm glad the era of NFL standardization is over. I have the same beef when it comes to things like NBA city uniforms. You have what seems like a league or an outside source trying to understand and represent the culture of a city. And it's coming from people who have no idea what the culture or the wants or the desires of a city are. And these NFL mascots are such a great example of that. The NFL was trying to create this standardized, big brand sort of look so that they could sell merchandise, they could sell more toys, they could appeal to younger fans, and they could accept the minds of the consumers when in reality, they didn't understand that teams like the Green Bay Packers or the New York Jets or the New York Giants had really rich, well-developed histories that are a whole reason people are fans of the team in the first place. And when you get these hideous NBA City uniforms or these really ugly NFL mascots, you realize that these teams should be the ones responsible for building their culture and building their history and building the representations that they want, not some league that's only doing it for the benefit of their pocketbooks. Thanks for sticking with me. I know this was a totally different kind of video. I'm hoping that I can hit more recent topics by turning one of these out a week. Obviously a little less editing, but hopefully a little easier to watch and a little easier to listen to. I have some other styles of videos here that I'll link around me and I'll catch you guys next week.